Ross Perot called Jody Batten's first book, Tough-Minded Management, the greatest management book ever written. Tough-Minded Management is now in its fourth edition and has been translated into over 20 languages. Mr. Batten has followed the success of his first book with another triumph, Tough-Minded Leadership. Joe Batten is a renowned corporate consultant, executive mentor, and speaker nationally and internationally. His teachings are acclaimed as the prototype for tomorrow's leaders. Through his books, live appearances on radio and television, and speaking engagements, Joe helps spouses, parents, youths, managers, and employees bridge the communication gap. His warmth and caring helps release the power within the listener to see what they can accomplish and become in the future. In this videotape, Mr. Batten will be sharing his insight, suggestions, and the action steps to become a tough-minded leader through a probing question-answer format, as well as live clips from selected speaking engagements. Joe, I've read your material. I love the concepts. I love the positive thrust of your philosophy. What I'd like to do today is to uh, explore more deeply into some of the key points and and perhaps discuss their practical application. Tremendous. Okay. Uh, let's start by having you define the concept of tough-mindedness. Well, the tough mind and the hard mind are not only not similar, they're exactly the opposite. You know, if you set on a hard surface a piece of granite and a piece of leather, and you hit that granite a hard blow, you'd shatter it. Because it's hard, it's rigid, it's non-dynamic, it's weak just like the hard, brittle personality, the hard, brittle mind. If you hit that piece of leather the very same blow, the hammer will even bounce. There'll be a little dent there, and it will spring back a little bit, because the leather is resilient. It is supple. It's durable. It's elastic. It's responsive. It's tough. And so I think the future belongs to the person whose mind is open, growing, stretching, and tough in the real sense of that word. But one of the things we want to establish this morning so very, very clearly is that the hard guy, the hard gal is out. That's the past. Anybody with rank or title can push, can drive, can tell people what to do. But it takes a lot of man or a lot of woman, a lot of person to lead. Wonderful. Describe to me the ideal tough-minded leader. Okay, the tough-minded leader, whether man, woman, or young person, uh, is a person, first of all, whose mind is filled, in, in, in the real sense of the word, with a sense of wonder, uh, a feeling of constant growth and discovery. Then that person, as a leader, leads uh, in a very real sense by what they are and who they are rather than what they do. See, once we know who and what we want to be, then it becomes relatively easy to know what to do. And so first of all, we start by making sure that the values between the ears are the right ones, because then the value of the example that says, follow me, uh, is there. You see, the, the stereotype manager pushes, drives, compresses, represses, and in a very real sense, depresses uh, team members. In fact, uh, the stereotype manager calls them employees. The tough-minded leader, uh, symbolically and figuratively, and sometimes literally, says, follow me. Try to stay within sight of my heels, and we'll get a lot done, and we'll have a lot of fun. But in the Middle East, there are two countries right across, across the border from each other. Both of these countries have large sheep or mutton industries. In one country, it's very profitable. In the other country, it's often quite unprofitable. In one country, the sheep grow up to be fat and healthy with fine wool and, and so on. In the other country, they grow up to be thin and scraggly and what has been described, I don't really know what a sheep psychologist is, but uh, have been, been described as a mild case of hysteria the young adult sheep in that country. Well, what are we getting at? What causes this? Think with me, please. Now, th this is true. This isn't something hatched up to make a point. In one country, the shepherds walk in front of the flocks. In the other country, the shepherds walk behind the flocks. 
In those countries where the shepherds walk in front of the flocks, uh, first, now let's take the other one first. Imagine, if you will, I'd like to ask all of you to imagine, to the extent that you can, that you're a young sheep growing up in the country where the shepherds walk behind their flocks. As long as you can remember, from the time you were an, a, a lamb, an infant sheep, you always heard and felt the force of authority coming from behind you. Are you with me? You never dared to leave the flock if you tried to, tried to get out and exercise some individuality, searching for some fresh grass or water or shade or to play with the other lambs. You could never do it. A dog is sent out to round you up, or you're wrapped alongside the head with a shepherd's crook, or, or he yells at you and you go back into the flock. And you stay in front of him, and he drives you. And as the months go by, you become compressed, repressed, and depressed. And you don't eat very well. You don't get much extra exercise. Now, it's been proven in that country that the young adult sheep often stands in the midst of deep grass and doesn't even eat. It's like the person who goes home from work at night who's been pushed and compressed and repressed and depressed all day. They got a knot in their belly. Good food doesn't sound that good. Maybe an extra drink does to loosen it up. But, you know, but who really needs that? And so it's not very profitable. In the other country, imagine that you're a young lamb. As long as you can remember, you can always see the good shepherd. Maybe that's what the Bible meant. You can always see the shepherd up ahead of you. If you want to get out here and experiment and play with the other lambs and run around and have fun and develop some individualism and eat a lot, wind up tired at night so that your muscles grow and you get big and fat, you can do it. All you have to do is catch up. That's a leader. The other one is a pusher. The, the tough mind, the tough-minded leader puts in front of his or her team every day or his or her family or whoever they're dealing with, uh, a person uh, who is, first of all, expecting the best from the person in the mirror. They understand that excellence is not just a buzzword that to repeat ad nauseum. Excellence means this, to give a thing your best shot and know it, and to be committed to doing that, and making sure that as life goes along, those intervals of, uh, of excellence get closer and closer. We're in no sense talking about perfection. When a, a, an executive says to me, you know, Joe, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I say, gosh, I'm sorry to hear it. And they look startled. Well, I thought you would think that was, say, oh, no. Mm -hmm. If you're committed to uh, perfection, you are on a collision course with certain failure. But if you constantly are committed to using your resources at a given point in time, to the, in the best way you can, and you know it, and you allow that gratitude to and for you to continue to fuel you internally, so that your capacity to give and expect and lead continues to grow, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a bunch of other values. The capacity, the desire not to tell, but to ask. And to carry that further, to ask, to listen, and to hear. Now, there's a big difference between listening and hearing. For instance, if you listen to me, Merle, today as we chat, you'll perceive the words that I use. But if you hear me and I do my job, you will understand what I mean. So we teach ask, listen, and hear to determine wants, needs, and possibilities in that order. What are some tough-minded attitudes? Oh, I, I love that question. Tough-minded attitudes. I think really of, of, uh, of the collective term attitude as, co as containing many, many, many tough-minded components. But, uh, okay, so for a total leadership style, of, of a, a total uh, tough-minded attitude, I see these as components. Uh, loving life. Uh, learning to love that person in the mirror so you can love other people getting in touch with your strengths so you can amplify and, and, and help unleash and focus the strengths of other people. 
tenacity, staying power. Uh, a, a very important one is the ability to focus like a laser. You know, a room full of light is nice, but it's just particles of light. And yet when you take light and condense it, focus it, concentrate it into laser beams, you know, we're discovering uh, hundreds and hundreds of miraculous new applications of the laser. It can pierce two feet of steel. It can reach up and bounce off Mars. You can use it for the most delicate brain or ear or eye surgery. And as we learn much more about how to focus, when we learn much more about how to discover uh, the enormous latent strengths within us, when we learn how to hang in there if we're committed to a cause that's bigger than we are, if we learn the joy of helping people work out patterns of success in their life that really work, and then we learn the, the sheer thrill of giving earned praise. But when President Lincoln was in the White House, he had the same practice that many other presidents have had. He attended various churches in the greater Washington, D.C. area. And on this particular Sunday, the minister had known for about three weeks that Lincoln was coming. And he'd put in a lot of effort preparing this sermon. And that day, because the president was there, there were many who thought it was his finest effort. And when it was all over, President Lincoln and uh, some of his staff were walking outside. Secretary of War Stanton and Lincoln got into the carriage to go back to the White House. Secretary Stanton said, Mr. President, what did you think of that sermon? And Lincoln said, now that you ask me, I have to be frank with you. I didn't think much of it. And this was actually overheard. Secretary of War Stanton said, Mr. President, what, what, what was the problem? Why didn't you? And Lincoln said this, and please remember this the rest of your lives. I ask you to. Can't tell you to, but I'm asking you to. He said, because he didn't ask us to do anything great. One of the very central core values is caring enough about you to care enough about other people. And I, I, I put it that way very deliberately. Unless you believe there's some greatness in you, you flat out will not be able to perceive and ask for greatness in others. And again, Lincoln said, he didn't ask us to do anything great. So I believe deeply, gentlemen, that if we love our people, and did you expect to hear the word love from this old tough ex-marine here? Love is the toughest emotion there is. You say, sissies talk about love? Sissies talk about love? Vince Lombardi, when asked what was the secret of the success of the Green Bay Packers, said these guys love each other. Let's go, let's go back to some leadership questions. How does leadership by expectation differ from traditional management concepts now used by American industry? Okay, uh, tune in on a typical manager's conversation, managers, and you'll hear him talk about, him or her talk about running a department or, or running a division or running a company. Stop and think about how silly that is. If, if, if you try to run something, a family or a relationship or an entire company, that means you're pushing it. Uh, you're forcing it. Uh, it's really as silly as terms like value-driven and market-driven and data-driven, uh, which one simply cannot do at all. Our values, if, if used productively in an unleashed, focused way, our, our, our values lead us, they stretch us, they give us something to reach for. Our customers should lead us. We should become customer-led, customer-responsive. Data, I am sick of the phrase data-driven, it should be data-responsive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so another way of putting it is that managers manage inventory, equipment, and data. Leaders lead people. And of course, all of us are familiar with hybrids, people who, who do a, a, some of both. But what we're calling for here is an all-out commitment to developing leadership. And you say, well, Joe, can everybody be a leader? 
Mustn't we have followers? And again, I would, I would uh, say that everybody can be a leader. Everybody should receive training and counsel to be a leader. If we have a, a leader of a major division, and all of those department heads that report to him or her are, are leaders in their own right, they will be much more capable of comprising a synergistic team. Now, if we drop below that level, and, the, and people on the, at the working level, out on the line in production or out selling or what have you. And each of those are constantly being led, helped to unfold and expand as personalities. They feel significant and empowered. They feel valued. They feel listened to. They will then follow in the real sense of the word and empower that leader. Mm -hmm. So the manager, for instance, can manage his department well and can lead in terms of ideas, creativity, uh, uh, in meetings, uh, in, in corporate decisions, or whatever. He can still be a leader in other aspects uh, and still no. be a good manager. No, you can be a, no? I wouldn't agree that he can manage his department well if he, you know, we become what we say. We not only become what we think, we become what we say. So as, as, as soon as he sees himself, I manage my department. It's much like I run my department. Uh, I can manipulate. I can move them around on the chart. I can drop them into convenient slots. They are simply resources for me to achieve my objectives. That's the typical managerial way of looking at it. But if on the contrary, it says let's get rid of the M word, manager, and let's focus all the way uh, throughout the warp and woof and weave, the whole fiber, the whole texture, the whole tapestry of the organization. Let's saturate it with leadership ideas, concepts. You know, what you're suggesting is, uh, what it calls for is, is an almost an entirely new vocabulary in the corporate world or in the industrial world. Uh, that's kind of a monumental project. And uh, I agree with you when you say, uh, in your material, you, we are what we say. We become and there, we, we become what we say, and we repeat certain phrases or certain titles, certain concepts so often that we believe them, whether we even think about them or not. How can we, uh, how can we begin to initiate this change? Well, first of all, we've supplied uh, in in the new book 135 terms in the glossary. We've actually defined these terms. For instance. Uh, I think that it's uh, virtually totally new to the American vocabulary to talk about reversing the G's. You know, G forces meaning forces of gravity. So at the core of all these things we're talking about, as you make the change from manager to leader, we're talking about releasing uh, something like uh, 80 to 90 uh, negative G forces of the past that pull us backwards and shackle us to the status quo and to yesterday. We're talking about another 80 to 90 positive, tough-minded G-forces that properly plugged into and studied and applied can pull us toward crystal clear visions, can pull us toward fulfillment of our dreams. Uh, one of the things that my colleagues and I see all over the country, particularly when we sit down behind closed doors with executives, is people who mean so well. I cannot overstress the good intentions of the average executive of, of businesses and nonprofit organizations and parents in this country. But they simply haven't perceived that they are shack shackling their possibilities. They are, they, they are literally nailed to the past as long as they continue to use a lot of apostrophe T's, a focus on weakness, a tendency to uh, 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 make statements without listening, being directive instead of expective. Uh, and, and on and on. And, and so being able to change those habits around uh, so that you plug into all of these possibilities that we call the positive G-forces, where you begin to look at a person in terms of their strengths, not their weaknesses, where you begin to ask instead of tell, where you begin to stretch and pull and expand people instead of push and compress and depress, where you where the major decisions in your life, and even the minor ones, are conditioned by dreams and goals bigger than you are. If you'll commit to trying and you say, from here on, in every dimension of my life, I'm going to focus on thoughts and words and actions that build and enhance, 
As soon as I find my thoughts drifting over here to thoughts or words or actions that diminish or destroy, I'll try to turn that thing around again. And of course, the key, most key way that we, that we start to become capable of this is to start to get in touch with our strengths. Now, here's the little thing I would like to ask you to do. There are three steps. Three simple steps. See, things that are simple and tough are what the good life's all about. The complex and easy, I hope you have no time for. Complex, easy answers are the reverse of simple, tough answers. First of all, step number one, I'd like to recommend that you buy a little notebook that you can carry easily. Get a, get a pretty good one with, with, with some kind of expensive soft leather. It'll only cost an extra buck or so. And have embossed on it, My Strength Notebook. And have your name on there in gold also. So step number one, you got the little notebook. Step number two, sit down with your, your spouse or a good friend or several people who may know you well. Close the door, block out an hour or more and sit down and begin to brainstorm on each other's strengths, making sure that you totally eliminate any reference to weaknesses. Step number three is the one that's simple and tough. I would then ask you to add to that notebook one new strength a week. One new strength a week. How does a tough-minded leader build a tough-minded team? Okay, Merle, I, I'd like to describe, first of all, what a tough-minded team is. Uh, when we assess a team in an organization to determine if they really are a team rather than just a department or a section or a motley assortment of people, we want to ask a number of things. One, does every member there know six things about their job and about the organization? Those six things are what, where, when, who, how, and above all, why? Now, in a sense, that says everything, but it doesn't say very much unless you understand what it means. The what, of course, means that they understand the mission, the goal, the objectives, and an action plan in which they all had a part. The action plan should also very specifically contain the when, the, 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 the how, the who, and the why, and the where. And then uh, when you have everybody, see, when you have an organization where the sum of the strengths is greater than, uh, where the whole is greater than the sum of the strengths, where people are expecting the best from each other, where people literally understand and believe that the finest gift you can give another person is to expect their best consistently as you look for and focus on their strengths, where people ask instead of tell, where uh, everybody realizes that the success of the whole department or unit is going to uh, impact fundamentally on their compensation. See, one of the things that we get very concerned about is when a company across the board gives everybody the same increase or the same bonus or the same incentive. Because this shouts loud and clear to the superior producer. Uh, you, you, you just, if you just barely cut the mustard here, you get the same treatment. So it's very important that compensation be tied directly to performance. It's where people have learned to enjoy empowering each other. Literally enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Where the leader has discovered that earned praise is one of the finest privileges and uh, among the, the most fun things that a leader can do. Now that can sound odd, fun things, but the real tough-minded leader believes that the, the great team is one where you get a lot done and have a lot of fun and that you can't do much of one without the other. And incidentally, I'd like to call on you right now throughout this company to toss out the word junket, employee. Anybody use the word employee now? Forget it. Please experiment with. Make sure that, you, 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 that people correct you if you don't do this. From here on, I'd like to feel that the people in this company are team members. All you have to do to see the validity of this, the practicality of it, 
is imagine that, imagine that the person that you report to introduces you as one of my employees. How will you feel? One of my employees. That's like saying one of my subordinates. If you ever take the word subordinate and break it down, it means, right out of the dictionary, inferior number. See, those days are over in America. The team has become the thing. The team is what it's all about. And so I recommend that all of you begin to see yourselves as on a team, and you begin to refer to your people at all times, at all times as team members. How can a tough-minded leader set clear expectations and goals for themselves and others? Well, as a very specific process, I recommend, first of all, for the individual tough-minded leader, not manager, uh, the, for the, for the tough-minded leader to set uh, or develop expectations for himself or herself, we recommend that a person isolate themselves for at least a couple of hours and write down, first of all, what they expect from the world in general, from their fellow person uh, themselves and their own conception of their own higher power, and, 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 and put down a lot of these things and then boil down the one, two, or three most important expectations, which we often call expectives, as contrasted with objectives. So there's no substitute for, for giving it real thought, real cogitation and celebration. Uh, it's not a thing to quickly develop. It's a thing to sit down and really think through, because our expectations condition everything that we become and everything that we get done. In one of my earlier books, I said that hope is the universal nourishment of the human being and that expectations are steps on the pathway of hope. So, they, so they, are, they are those steps from here to your ultimate goal, and they deserve lots of thought. As I toured the country with Vince Lombardi a number of years ago, any of you recall Vince? Was he tough? He wasn't hard, like many people think. He was really, really a tough-minded guy. There were lots of hard head coaches in the, in the NFL at that time. There were few tough-minded ones. Vince called it mental toughness. I called it tough-mindedness. But he understood this, you see, that perhaps one more time, Perhaps the finest gift you can give another person is the gift of an excellent and stretching expectation based on a never-ending search for their present and potential strengths. Now, he practiced this. I've seen him have sessions like, uh, I recall one night in Green Bay, he didn't think Max McGee, you remember Max McGee, you football fans? Max was tremendous, wasn't he? All pro many times. And uh, Lombardi says, Max, come over here. And he made sure the other players didn't hear. I, but I was standing there. He said, Max, uh, how fast are you? Max said, I, get, I do the 100, and I think it was 9-something. He said, uh, are you the fastest uh, end in the NFL? Max said, yeah, I guess I am. He said, every time you go down the field now, are you moving that fast? And Max said, no, coach. I noticed that he was using questions. He wasn't making declarative statements. Max, do you think you could go quite a bit faster every time you go downfield? Yeah, coach. And he looked right at him. You know, Lombardi almost had to look at his belt buckle. Max was big. He said, Max, do you understand that I'm asking you every time you go down that field to go as fast as you can? Max said, right, coach. He said, then I'm expecting you to do it. Do you read me? McGee grinned, but he was serious. He said, yes, coach. And he went out and he did. Notice what happened. See, he focused on the guy's weakness. Excuse me. Focused on McGee's strengths. He made no reference to his weaknesses. He didn't say, Max, here's what you aren't doing or what you didn't do or what you can't do. Those lousy apostrophe T's that great leaders have no time for. He didn't use any of those, he, he, and, and he didn't make declarative statements. He asked questions. Max, can you do this? How do you feel about this? See, Max felt that he was a, he partially authored. He felt a part of that decision that was made. And believe me, it was a decision. Because when Lombardi says, said, 
then I expect you to do it. A decision was made, not a tentative statement. Now, see, when we push people, when we tell them, when we use apostrophe T's, when we focus on their weaknesses, no matter how firmly we say it, we aren't going to get a heck of a lot done. Certainly not their best. But when we ask them, and we listen, and we hear, and they know we want to know more about their wants and their needs and their possibilities, and we get this commitment following the involvement, then when we ask firmly, and believe me, in tough-minded management, Sure, we say love is the toughest mind emotion. Sure, we say we ask, we don't tell. And we stress the need for, whenever feasible, making sure that your team member understands not just what to do, but the what, where, when, who, how, and above all, the why of what you're asking them to do. And then the tough-minded leader expects it and makes it very clear. Joe, how would you define communication? Oh, I love that. First of all, let's define dialogue. Uh, that lousy word that is overdone every way we turn. Uh, guys, I read, uh, heard repeatedly recently that we were going to start a dialogue with a certain foreign power. And each time I wanted to say, why? Dialogue only means two or more people engaged in monologues. That's the technical definition. Communication, I'm leading into this because communication is a word we hear so often. I think it is almost overused, but certainly under understood. And it means four beautiful words. Four words that get out everything, really. All the warp and woof and weave of the tough-minded leadership style. It means shared meaning, shared understanding. I've recommended many times over the years that executives just put the four words, shared meaning, dot, 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 shared understanding, up on their wall and let it soak in. When you say shared understanding, again, we, we touched on it earlier, I think there has to be a way sometimes to get our own egos out of the way so that we can truly get into how someone else is feeling, to hear what they say. How do we do that? How can we put our own egos aside and try to understand what that other person is trying to communicate? We tend to obtrude or or build buffers between ourselves and other people in the absence of sufficient ego or knowledge of our own strengths or self-confidence. In other words, if I believe enough in me and I like me enough, I won't even have any tendency then to, to build any, uh, any buffers between us. I'll be able to ask, listen, hear, care, and, li and, and really listen with my mind, my heart, and my, and my spirit. Uh, if I don't feel very, very secure, in other words, if I don't have enough ego, I will probably uh, do some things. I, I may ask my questions or make statements in a hedging way that, that makes you respond with an equally hedging or semi-defensive thing, and all we'll have is dialogue. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, we can only build shared meaning, shared understanding, or real communication with our team members by being open by being real, by being what we call emotionally vulnerable, where you keep your guard down, you know, I'm not talking about physically, but where, where you keep your uh, emotional guard down. And you let your people in, their wants, their needs, their problems, their possibilities. And you let you out. But when you sit down with your people, have the confidence to ask, to listen, to hear. And then you see when you agree on those major decisions in your department, or on a particular piece of work, they feel part of it. They feel valued. They feel affirmed. They feel confirmed. They feel assured. They feel reassured. Let me put it this way, gentlemen. If, there were, if I wanted to suggest one nonviolent way for you to put your department, or the company indeed, out of business within a year, you could do that. Let's put it, I'm going to phrase it negatively just for fun. If everybody here and everybody in the company decided, I'm going to get everything I can get from the moment I get up in the morning from my family, from my, my team members, from the people I report to, in, from my community, from everybody around. I'm going to get all I can get for me. Within days, if you did that successfully enough, you'd feel a pall of discouragement and bickering start within the company. You'd begin to see finger pointing. 
you'd begin to see what's in it for me. What can I get from you? But you see, we're not talking about a cute little term called go-getter and go-giver. We're saying that's a lousy way to live and work. And the person who wants to really lead, who says, follow me, try to stay with inside of my heels, we'll get a lot done, we'll have a lot of fun, is saying, what can I give you in terms of example, inspiration, perspiration, dedication, clear and stretching expectations? Since motivation can't be given, how can a tough-minded leader create an environment for self-motivation? Okay, that's, the, that, that's uh, in a nutshell, the, the principal role of the tough-minded leader. We've said here that the tough-minded leader is above all analogous to a compass that provides direction and pull. Now, so it's very important to realize you cannot reach out and, and motivate people. You, you need to, to provide a, a climate, a relationship, uh, an example that helps them motivate themselves. But let's take a look at the meaning of the word motivation. If you take the word and break it down and you spell it motive dash ation or motive action, which is what it means, and you classically transpose it to means action to achieve motive. That's essentially what motivation is. So when you help an individual, of course you must do it first to be able to do it effectively, to help an individual clarify their motives and then develop the program of action to achieve them, that in the very down-to-earth nuts and bolts way is what motivation really is. So you set up a climate of motivation in an organization when you first clarify the, 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 the vision, the mission, the goals, the philosophy, and, and, and as we get right on down, our goals, objectives, action plans. Those are all levels of motives. The action plan indeed is the, are the steps, the tactics needed to fulfill the strategy that has preceded it. Now, so that's the way you look at it corporately, or divisionally, or departmentally. In individual life, then, if you're sitting down privately to mentor with or counsel with a person who needs a higher level of positive motivation, step one, you want to help them discover who they are, then, then, then help uh, proceed beyond that to who and what they want to be and then set pro programs, help them develop programs of action to become that kind of person. And then secondarily, programs of doing. The action plan, the doing steps, should always be preceded by the being steps. Now this is a very crucial thing. Across the nation today we have most people, I'm tempted to say over 90% of the young people, young today and those who were young yesterday, uh, who are being pushed into making decisions on what to do without ever being helped to determine who and what to be. So being should always pre precede doing. And what we're really calling for, as I said right at the outset, is to move beyond being managers. And again, if you don't have a managemental job here, Daddy, that, isn't, that, that has nothing to do with it. You're still managing your lives. But I'm asking you to move beyond the M word to leading, to leading your life. And if you have people reporting to you, to leading your team members. A leader possesses a degree of power. How does a tough-minded leader use it? Uh, a real leader, even in a small section or within a home, possesses lots of power. And, and I'm talking about the real definition of power now. A moment ago I mentioned that Gandhi led millions and millions of Indians to freedom from the so-called British yoke without any power of the usual kind. Economic, social, political, financial, and so on. But uh, he had real power. The power of an example, the power of quality thinking, the, the power of, of, of stretching and clear expectations. So the leader, no matter at what level, they might be leading a very small unit, but when they realize that they have the, the, the opportunity to either enhance or destroy, to some extent, that person. That's power. Let me elaborate on that. If you believe, as I do, that nobody can live in neutral even for a second, then there's a real tough, and it can be a liberating or frightening thought. But I want to, want to be sure and share this with you. We really only have two options in life. We can say them 400 ways. 
But we really only have two options, and that is to make sure that every thought, word, and deed either builds or destroys, because we can't live in neutral for even a second. So it can be liberating when you say, hey, that means the rest of the years of my life, I just realized that, uh, that I have an opportunity every minute of the day to, to enhance or build something or someone. And I don't have a moment to waste by backing away from that opportunity to destroy or diminish any person or anything. So we're not talking about anything, you know, that's, that's out of sight or out of reach or unrealistic. We're saying that we can start today, begin a process of retooling, and it can go on all of our lives because I've never yet met the perfect person. And uh, so if we can say, certainly I'm not perfect, I'll fail, I'll, I'll, I'll have setbacks, but every day, at least in very small increments, I will make significant progress in making sure that every thought, every word, every action, in some way, enhances people or things. Joe, if you had only a moment to communicate something that could help a leader make positive changes in their lives, what would that be? Six words. Never lose your sense of wonder. It is that fresh outlook on life, that evergreen outlook, whether you're 87 or 37 or 7, that can make all the difference. When you have that hungry, thirsty desire to acquire new growth, new insights, new experience. Uh, all the other things we've discussed will fall into place. Never lose your sense of wonder. So people, real strong, tough-minded leaders, love, and they show it. They feel it. They let it out. So I'd like to close with a few lines of poetry that is from my heart to yours. It goes like this. Isn't it strange? that princes and kings, and clowns that caper in sawdust rings, and common people like you and me are builders for eternity. Each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass in a book of rules. And each must make and can. Our life is flown, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. I wish all of you an enormous number of stepping stones. I love you all. Thank you.